getting started in Bible study today. Just to let you know, we I've changed curriculums for today. Hopefully next week I'm going to have both curriculums up and going. But right now, this week, we're going to do Bible studies for life. And here's the reason why. is because uh, the other Bible study is Proverbs and Song of, so Song of Songs. And I'm hoping to get that covered as well next week. Uh, but this week, looking at our topics, just seemed a little more applicable in what we're doing. So, because uh, the next six weeks we're going to be covering living with hope in a broken world. And I think that's very applicable for what we're trying, what we're living in right now. But also in July, and hopefully that's going to be the times when we are back together as Sunday school, we're going to be talking about why do I need the church. And uh, since we haven't really had church for the past three months, uh, the way that we're used to it, I think it's just a great question we need to ask ourselves. And we need to uh, dive into of why do I need the church. So uh, we'll be diving into those as well. Today the lesson though is the basis for our hope. And we're going to be in 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to be going 1 through, I think verses 1 through 9. Yep, verses 1 through 9 today. So make sure you have your Bible. Make sure you have a pen. Make sure you have a notebook. And uh, even if it's not the curriculum you're used to, maybe it's just still something you want to listen to just to hear about God's Word. And then hopefully we can do the other curriculum, explore the Bible as well uh, next week. All right. So when have you been glad that you haven't given up on something? Think back in time, think back in life when there, maybe there was a time, uh, that you just gave up on something, or maybe you didn't give up on something. What were those times? Just think and reflect on that. Quick story. Florence Chadwick was a champion, a long distance swimmer, and she swam 21 miles across the English channel back in 1950. She did it faster than any, any other woman in history. But in 1952, she set a higher, loftier goal. She tried to swim the 26-mile route from Catalina Island and the California mainland. And she swam through an oil leak, nausea, uh, fatigue. Uh, she swam for more than 15 hours. But as a result, in the midst of that, a heavy fog set in. And uh, when this fog sat in on the coastline, the temperatures began to change, her breathing became uh, labored, and since she couldn't see the shore, she feared she was swimming in circles and didn't know where she was. She had lost hope in the midst of this challenge. What she didn't know, though, is that she was half a mile from achieving her goal. She was half a mile from from swimming that entire feat. She went 25 and a half miles to give up with half a mile to go because she couldn't see the finish line. And uh, I hope that just as she lost hope in the midst of that, that there's probably been times in our life where we have lost hope because we couldn't see the finish line. And we didn't know exactly where we were and we may have thought we're just going in circles and uh, we just needed to get off that crazy train right there, right? But, but here, the Apostle Peter points to the sure hope that we have in Christ. And uh, we may become weary, we may become discouraged, but victory is much closer than we realize. And it's because of our hope in Christ. So as we dive in, as we get into 1 Peter, I want you to know that only hope in Christ is sure and certain. Only hope in Christ is sure and certain uh, as we go on. So as we look at 1 Peter, just a little bit of context to Peter. Peter's one of the 12 apostles. Matter of fact, he's the, the leader of the 12 apostles as they go in. The book of 1 Peter is probably written around 80, 60s, uh, and it's written to the believers in Asia Minor, uh, all, what we would call modern Turkey today, uh, beginning to face opposition because of their faith, because of Nero, who's probably in control at this point. Probably not at the time when Nero starts really just attacking uh, Christians, but it's the groundwork for it. Okay, so Peter, in the midst of his book, knows that one persecution is breaking out. He also knows it's going to get worse. Okay, As a matter of fact, as you get to chapter four, he says, "It's <laughs> we're just at the beginning of this. It's going to get worse. Be prepared." So, because of all this, he writes to affirm the faithfulness of the believers and encourage them to persevere through what they are suffering. The primary basis of his encouragement was their certain hope through their faith in Jesus Christ. So uh, as we see this, uh, as we dive into this, let's look into 1 Peter chapter 1. 
Here's what I'm gonna do to try to hopefully shorten up my time on videos so it doesn't get longer and longer because I found out I'm a, I'm a good teacher, preacher that over the course of weeks, they've gone from 20 minutes to 40 minutes. So to try to keep that down, here's what I want you to do is I want you to pause right now. I want you to take out your notebook. I want to take out your Bible and a pen. And I want you to go ahead and read all the verses. And I want you to jot in your notebook some of the key words, key verses that jump out at you. So go ahead and pause right now. And I want you to read verses 1 through 9 because that's the whole text that we're going to be covering. And I'm going to jump in and highlight some words as well. But I want you to read through it on your own. Where's the Holy Spirit? pointing out certain words or phrases to you as well. So go read that, come back, we'll dive in, okay? As we jump back in, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, Peter's an apostle Jesus to those chosen living in, in exile, dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. If you don't know how to pronounce the word, just say elephant, we'll be okay. But when we talk about dispersed, the Greek word there is diaspora, and diaspora means scattered. Uh, just like when the uh, Nebuchadnezzar came in and scattered everyone, all the Jews across, they have all these synagogues that pop up in all these major cities. And as you see Paul going through the book of Acts, he goes to the synagogue first. It's the diaspora, the spreading out of the Jewish people. Here we talk about the exiles and the diaspora of the Christians. They've been cast out. They've been kicked out. So he's writing not just to one church, but to the area of churches in this area in, in Turkey and says, hey, here's a letter to you, but it applies to all these other churches as well. So when we talk about the word diaspora, diaspora, dispersed abroad, that's what we're talking about. Those that are being persecuted and have been sent out. In verse two, what you see and what I really like about verse two is the Trinity's mentioned, right? According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. Peter addresses all three of the Trinity in this verse, and I just like it when you can see them all together right there. Uh, but blessed be the God of our fathers. Why? Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth and a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope is based on the death and resurrection of Christ. Our hope is based on Jesus being crucified, but not just him being crucified, but on him coming back to life, being resurrected. Because if he's not resurrected, then he hasn't conquered death. And our hope is not complete, but he has done both. So our hope is based on the death and the resurrection of Christ. So as we look, as we look through this, understand the believers at this time are, it's not all roses and sunshine for them. It's not the feeding of the 5,000 at this point. It's individuals being persecuted, individuals being sought after. This is, go back to the time when Paul is ravaging the church and going and people are leaving. This is the context that the believers have. Some may have already experienced when Paul was ravaging the church or Saul before he became a believer. You know, they've gone to other areas where they've been cast out and kicked out. Here is where the Roman Empire is starting to turn against this a section of Judaism called Christianity or the way and you see the persecution break out Peter recognizes this and knows that our only hope a living hope that we have is the hope that we place in God and uh, it's been secured by Jesus it's been by his finished work on the cross it's not just a positive mindset that we have it's not wishful thinking and it's not striving to make things work it is a hope that we have in him it is a done deal living hope is rooted in the living word that we that we have and it's because we've been chosen by god saved by the death and resurrection of his son we are set apart in his spirit so our hope is based on the death and resurrection of christ and because of that the spirit comes and lives inside of us and the spirit comes and lives inside of us we have a true living hope inside of us so what kind of things do people place their hope in today what kind of things do people place their hope in today? What do you place your hope in outside of Christ? Now, before you get all spiritual and you say, I only place my hope in, in Christ, I want you to really think about it because I think things slip into our life that we put priority over. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's our spouse. Maybe it is work. Maybe it's us as we're just trying to be better and improve ourselves 
that we put a more faith in ourselves doing better than we do in saying, God, I just need you to take control of this. Holy Spirit, I need you to change me in this area. Maybe that's the hope we need to put our that we need to put our faith in and not our faith in ourselves. So so maybe you need to pause. Maybe you need to ask that question. What kind of things do people place that are open today? And what but also, what do you find most encouraging when you read verse 3? What do you find most encouraging when you read verse 3? Pause it now. Think about that for a little bit. Write it, write it out. And then we're going to jump back in. As we jump back in, as you've already answered those questions, we're going to move on to verses 4 and 5. And in 4 and 5, we, we, we see here that our hope is secure for eternity. We see the hope in Jesus that we have is based in his death and resurrection is secure for all eternity. And when I just look through verses 4 and 5 with some key words in there, I look at the word inheritance. And that word inheritance is a military uh, word. It's a continual guarding like a fortress. So it's not just a we're, God is guarding us with an inheritance our hope is god is our fortress around us and he continually watches over so that no one can come in and rob us no one can come in and overthrow us we have a secure inheritance but it's also as being guarded i'm sorry that inheritance is imperishable undefiled and un, and unfading but we're being guarded by god as a fortress and why by god's power his force his strength, his ability through faith for salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. So having this inheritance that we talk that's talked about in verse 4, it's not a material inheritance necessarily. It's actually a term used uh, in the Greek that was also used in the Old Testament for when Israel came into the promised land. That was their inheritance. The promised land was their inheritance. And then the tribes got set sections of land but it wasn't an inheritance like hey when i die you get all the money you get the property it's this idea of we have an inheritance there is a place for us that has been promised to us that's the kind of inheritance inheritance that's talked about here but how, do, how does peter describe this inheritance look at these three words that he uses imperishable okay the term imperishable describes a territory so secure that no invading force can destroy it. Israel has been overrun by other nations multiple times, but Peter assures these believers that would never happen with their salvation. That will never happen with their salvation. It is imperishable. Once you're saved, there is nothing in this world that can take it away from you. That inheritance is imperishable, but it's also undefiled. This word here relates to purity of our inheritance. Our inheritance is thoroughly fire-resistant in every respect, unstained by the world, and is completely and wholly pure. It is imperishable. It is undefiled, but also it is unfading. Our inheritance will never lose its glory. Other churches will diminish. Other, other, their appearance and their value may increase or decrease. But our inheritance in Christ will never grow dull, never become dim, never be destroyed, and never fade. What an inheritance we have in Christ Jesus. The inheritance of eternity and that hope is secure for all eternity. And it is imperishable. It is undefiled. It is unfading. What a promise that Peter is giving to the believers here. Of how we can look at things through his eyes and say, you need to understand... I'm that sinner that turned his back on Christ. I'm the sinner that always bucked at Jesus. But here, my hope's in this secure eternity. And it's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. So where do you find your source of strength? Where do you find your source of strength? Think through just a couple of things. Do you find your strength in financial stability? Do you find it in your good health? Do you find it in your spouse or family? What about uh, the ability to make wise choices? What about your job or your future career advancements? Maybe there's other things that you find as your source of strength. And what words or phrases would you use to describe your hope placed in Jesus versus the other words that we just listed out? 
So as we look and as we're about to move in, just a couple of questions to add to that. What can we know for certain about our inheritance in these verses? What can we know for, in, in, for certain about our inheritance? But also, how does it make you feel knowing that you're being guarded by God's power? Just pause and reflect on those couple of questions. One, where's your source of strength? And it, is it in God or not? But then also, how can you know for certain about your inheritance from these verses? And how does it make you feel knowing that you're being guarded by God's power? So jumping back in, we're hitting our last section here, verses 6 through 9. Uh, just as I look through real quick, verse 7, proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire so you talk about your character of your faith refined by fire so on may result in praise glory and honor at that revelation of jesus christ so our here our hope is displayed through genuine faith our hope is displayed so we have hope in our um let me go back to my notes real quick we are, our hope is based on on the death and resurrection of christ our hope is secure in eternity, but our hope is displayed to others through genuine faith. So when we see this, believers, for the believers Peter's addressing, their present faith help them endure suffering. Okay, so by suffering, what am I showing? I'm showing you how much I believe in my Lord and Savior because I'm willing to suffer and be persecuted for it. Now what you see around is everyone else saying that person really believes in what he says and then they become believers when I was in Nigeria uh, there was a persecution breaking out among a tribe uh, and among this tribe what happened was is they were a very devout Islamic tribe matter of fact it was the Islamic tribe that that it was the tribe that brought Islam into Nigeria but what we were seeing when we got there was there was a huge revival breaking out. And a lot of people were coming to know Christ. This Islamic tribe was coming to know Christ. And the missionary I was meeting with had a meeting with three of these tribe leaders, or Christian leaders. And what happened was, is they, the week before, they were baptizing three new believers. Immediately, someone comes out with a machine gun, kills a guy that got baptized, and immediately when he was coming out of the water, was shot and killed. The pastor that was baptizing him got shot in the arm and ran away. Two other people were killed, and several others escaped. A week later, here's a pastor with a bullet hole in his arm showing up to learn, how can I be more effective in sharing the gospel to my tribesmen? The very ones that had the guns that were shooting at them. Because see, when you sit there and you understand the persecution that goes on, people want to know, why do you believe in your Savior and in your Lord? And why is that different than the other religions around here? Because you're willing to suffer for it. You're willing to die for it. You're willing to put everything on the line for it. And so by our hope is being displayed through our genuine faith. And this context was persecution. In our context, it's not necessarily persecution. It just may be we're willing to share faith with someone that doesn't have faith or doesn't have a genuine faith. And we just want to help explain the gospel to them. The magician's pen and teller, uh, I believe it's pen, is an atheist, devout atheist, knows he's atheist. But one of his challenges that he always asks is, is that if you truly believe in Jesus Christ, why is it you don't feel compelled enough to share the gospel with me? He goes, and that's why I really struggle with Christianity. Is because if you truly believe that's the only way for me to get to heaven, why is it you look at me who you know is an atheist and you don't even care or you don't even try to share your message with me? Now that's convicting for us, but how many of our neighbors are kind of the same way? They see us go to church. They see us read our Bible. They see us talk in conversations about Jesus and about God. But have we given them a genuine faith for them to ask questions and say, 
Why do you believe what you believe? Have we had the conversations with them where they know exactly what it is that we believe in? They've been given a choice to come join us, to come be a part of that. So what's the connection between our faith and hope? What is the connection between our faith and hope? And how can trials develop uh, rather than dim our hope? Some great questions for us to think about as we wrap up. But um, when tempted to despair and give up and defeat, remember that you have a living hope secured by Christ. All right? So as we wrap up, I just want to kind of take and, and remember, here are the questions I want you to think about when this is over, right? What's the connection between our faith and hope? And how can trials develop rather than dim a believer's hope? But I also want you to look at this. Is there a place in your life where you're losing hope? It's fine. It's okay. Most believers at some point are going to lose hope or they're, they're, it's going to dim a little in their life. But we need to recognize that and admit it too. Not just assume it will go away. Admit to God where you are losing hope, right? Confess any sin you may have in your life and ask him to open your eyes to the reality of the living hope in Christ. Renew that relationship with Christ. But also, as you go back, read over all these verses again, verses one through nine. Make a list of how Peter describes those who follow and trust Christ. Place this list around so that you can always be reminded as the next couple of weeks, you can be reminded of the hope we have in Christ. But also, is there someone the Lord has brought to your mind who's losing hope? And that's one of the things that we've been trying to do is reach out and call as pastors and as ministers to reach out and call and keep update of how everyone's doing and what are the needs. And we've had a huge response of people uh, talking with us and, and expressing their needs, but also just the joy of someone contacting them. But you know what? It's your job too. If someone, God's probably placing someone in your life, you just need to make a phone call this week. Send a text message, make a phone call, go do a personal visit. And as you do that visit, just say, hey, God just brought me to mind because I was worried you may be losing hope, and I just want you to know there's still hope. And we are still here as a church, as a body of believers coming to minister to you. So, but thank y'all for joining me today. Let me close this up in prayer as we celebrate the hope that we have in Christ. Father God, I do thank you for today. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your son. And through your son's death, through his resurrection, we have hope and an inheritance that's not defiled, doesn't fade away, doesn't go away, can't be taken away, but it is guarded by you. We rejoice in that. We love you for that. Thank you for preparing for a place for us in for all eternity. And as we move forward, Father, let our faith be genuine. Let our faith be shown to others around us that we have hope in you and that they can have hope in you as well. Let us minister to those that you've put in our path. Let us share the gospel with those you've put in our path and that you've laid on our heart. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank y'all. See you next week.